chapter 1. Paulus, doulos Jesu Christu, Cletas apostolos, aphorismenas es evangelion theu, ha pra epengelata dia ton propheton eltu, in grafais hagiais, peri tu huyu eltu, tu genan menu experimentas dawid, katas arca, tu harisentas huyu theu, in diname katapanuma hagiosunes, ex anastasios necro. Hi everyone, I'm trying to answer this question. Did Paul identify Jesus with God? And when did Jesus become a son of God, so to speak? So, I checked out Romans 1.4 and if we, if we check Romans by four different translations, just a second. So, for example, Romans 1, 4. And was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of Holiness by His resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. And if it's in Russian. И открылся Сыном Божьим в силе по Духу Святыни через воскресение из мертвых о Иисусе Христе Господе нашим. And if it's in Latin. Uh, I'm not a good reader, but here, here we, we see that it speaks a bit about predestination. Qui predestinatus est filius Dei in virtute secundum spiritum sanctificationis ex resurrectione mortuorum Iesu Christi Domini Nostri. Okay, so if we if we check different translations, here is Fitzmaier's translation. This is the commentary uh, that we're going to read in, in, in a sec. He says it's established. Fitzmaier thinks it's established, not... Uh, we know that Fitzmaier is Catholic, but he... Um, he doesn't believe that this predesti predestinatus is connected with predestination, but rather with establishment. Then uh, we see in ESV, International Standard Standard Version, English, sorry, English Standard Version, declared, NIV was appointed, the Son of God in power. New Literal Translation was shown to be, KGV, same as in ESV, declared to be the Son of God with power. Now we see Wycliffe Bible Translation goes together with uh, Vulgate, yeah, Vulgate, Vulgate, was before ordained, and anyway, a Latin translation, was before ordained the Son of God in virtue. And this is um, in, uh, in Polish. But anyway, Latin we already read, and that's about it. And if we read what uh, Fitzmaier has to say about it. It's going to be something like this. Established or determined. Uh, this, I don't even know what, what he means by this. Stands in parallelism to Genomenon, verse 3, and expresses the higher condition for which Jesus was destined by the Father. The verb Horizain literally set a boundary to limit the limit is rare in Pauline writings, even though no Greek manuscripts read manuscript reads poros porostentos. See Cranfield Romans sixty one one the Vulgate It's different versions of Vulgate or something, I don't know. And some Latin writers uh, rendered the PDC predestinatus, or that phrase, predestin predestined, which persisted in the Western theological tradition, whereas Eusebius regarded pro prorestinatus, this is, uh, this is the phrase, to orisphentos, huyo theu. So here, uh, 
we see Eusebius regarded Porus Poristhentos as a corruption of the text contra contra Marcellum or Marcellum 1.2 Epiphanius used it in a quotation of the of this text Pan, uh, Panarion John Chrysostom interpreted Horistentos as displayed, manifested, acknowledged, judged, confessed. Dechentos. Apophthathentos. Homologethentos. Crethentos. In Epistle Adromanos, Homily 1.2, PG 60.397. Elsewhere in the New Testament, Horizane means appoint, determine, establish, Constitute Acts two twenty three Acts ten forty two Acts eleven twenty nine Acts seventeen twenty six and thirty thirty one Hebrews four seven a meaning that should be used here. In some of these passages it is related to God's foreknowledge or determination, but of itself it does not connote predestination, it suggests rather a decisive act of divine appointment or establishment. The passive is theological. Established by God, ZBG, some commentary probably, paragraph 236. Established by God. See further Allen, Old Testament background. G. Schneider, Horizo, EDNT, that's commentary. As the Son of God with power. This phrase parallels the Son's Davidic descent. The Gospel now reveals that Jesus is not merely God's Son born in a human way of Davidic lineage, but God's Son. As a source of power, before the resurrection, Jesus Christ was the Son of God in the weakness of his human existence. As of the resurrection, he is the Son of God established in power and has become such of the vivif vivifying of all human beings. The base surrounds the preposition phrase and dunami with power. Is it part of the pre line form formulation or not? For Bultmann, T TNT 1.0. Point forty nine and Casiman commentary twelve, it is for Barrett Romans eighteen through twenty and Schweizer Ökumene, it is not. Much can be said for either position, as it now stands in the Pauline context. It marks a distinct contrast with Jesus's status as of birth, as as Casiman notes, it functions like endoxa in First Timothy three sixteen and. Hypselois in Hebrews 1 3 and should be regarded as pre Pauline. Second, does the phrase modify adverbially the PTC Horistentos or adjective, adject, adjectively the title Huyotheu? In the former instance, it would mean decisively established, determined, that is, by a mighty act, compared. It with Mark 9 1, 1 Corinthians 15 43, 1 Thessalonians 1 5. So the NEB, Goodspeed, and Sunday and Headlam, Romans 9. In the latter instance, it would mean Son of God with power, that is, Son as a source of power, Son enthroned in the heavenly sphere of power. So Casiman, Commentary 12, Barrett, Romans 20, Cranfield, Romans 62, Schleier, Rome Brief 24. The second meaning is to be preferred for the power is that by which God affects Jesus' resurrection and endows him with the source of life to energize human beings who turn to him as the risen Lord. See 1 Corinthians 6.14, Philippians 3.10, see if it's my to know him. Good Greek style would call for an article to before the preposition phrase as Paul often writes. See Maori, articular prepositional attributes, but Paul also uses preposition phrase Phrases adjectively and unearth unearthly elsewhere. Six six four diato baptismatos aston thanaton ten six he deesis proston theon Galatians three eleven hodicaius ek pistios first Corinthians two seven theo sophian and mysterio compared with BDF two seven two. The title Son of God is not being used in a messianic sense. Pace, Boismard, Constitute, 17, and Langevin, Quell Est, 150 51. Nothing is 
intimated in the text about Jesus' anointed status or agency, and no Old Testament background relates Son of God to Messiah, nor is the contrast between Jesus' weak human condition and his powerful risen status an indication of his messianic role. Moreover, Paul is not thinking here of an inner Trinitarian relationship of Father and Son, but only of the unique relation of Jesus Christ as Son to God the Father in the salvific process. For Paul, there is... Again, I'll repeat this. Moreover, Paul is not thinking here of an inner Trinitarian relationship of Father and Son, but only of the unique relation of Jesus Christ as Son a son to God the Father in the salvific process. For Paul, the resurrection made a difference in that process, but it did not make Christ the Son of God. Period. And that was Fitzmaier. Strong's G, 3724. Harizo. Harizo. Okay, here we see another approach by uh, Dr. Schreiner. Verses 3 and 4 introduce the reader to the substance of the gospel that Paul preached. The gospel that is from God and about him is centered on his son. And this son fulfills what the scriptures promised. So see Anderson, 1993, 32. The son is then described through two participial clauses in verses 3 and 4 that are usually understood to be a pre-Pauline hymn or creedal formulation. The reference to Jesus as the son re recalls Israel's status as God's son. See below. Nonetheless, most scholars see a reference to Jesus' pre-existence pre in the words perito huyo auto, concerning his son. Dunn's object objections to reading pre-existence out of this phrase are not decisive. Jesus is the true Israel, but he also he is also the pre-existent son whom God sent into the world, Romans 8.3. In other words, the term son works as more than one works at more than one level. It designates Jesus as the true Israel and as the son who existed before his incarnation. This placement of the words to huyo o to before the two part participles suggests that the one who became the seed of David and was appointed God's son in power at the resurrection was already the son before these events. Cranfield 1975, 58, Wilkins 1978, pages 64 and 65. The one who existed eternally as the Son was appointed the Son of God in power as the Son of David. The new dimension was not his sonship, but his heavenly installation as, as God's Son by virtue of his Davidic sonship. In other words, the Son reigned with the Father from all eternity, but as a result of his incarnation and atoning work, he was appointed to be the Son of God as as one who was now both God and man. We do not have the, pre the precision here of the later Christological form formulas in the history of the Church, but verses like these were the raw materials from which later Christology was developed. Most important, by calling Jesus the Son, Paul now assigns to Jesus the designation for Israel as God's Son, Exodus 4, 22, 23, Jeremiah 31, 9, Hosea 11, 1, Wisdom of Sirach, 11.13, Jubilees, 1.24.25, Sounds of, uh, of Solomon, 18.4, Moses, 10.3, 10, and some other reference. This does not mean that there is no significance in being a member of ethnic Israel, Romans 9-11. through 11. But if Jesus is God's true Son, then membership in the people of God depends on being rightly, rightly related to Jesus. As Paul says elsewhere, he is the singular seed of Abraham. Galatians 3.16, and thus the blessing of Abraham, Galatians 3.14, is available only to those who belong to the Messiah, Jesus. In order to understand what verses 3.4 say about the Son, it is helpful to depict their structure. So, Mu, that's Douglas Mu, 1991. To genomeno, who has come. Ex, uh, to orisfent to Horisthentos, who was appointed. Expermatos David, from the seed of David. Huyo the, Theu and, and Duna, Duname, son of God in power. Katasarka, according to the flesh. Katapneuma, Hageosunas, Katapneuma Hageosunas, according to the spirit of holiness. 
ex Anastasios Necron from the resurrection of the dead. That's the great contrast. You see? Both lines begin with a parti participial construction and share a kata phrase in common. The second line is more expansive than the first, adding the words and duna and duname to huyo theu hagio sunes to kata pneuma and ex and ex anastasios necron has no parallel in the first column. Most scholars, as we have noted, think that a pre-Pauline hymn or creed is being cited in here. Among the reasons for this. Among the, reasons, uh, among the reasons for this are the participial constructions, the parallelism of the two clauses, the utilization of hapax legomena, opidzein pneuma hagiasunas, and theological themes that are uncommon in Paul, such as the references to the Vedic sonship of Jesus, compared with P. Beasley Murray, 1980, pages 147-48. Paul may be drawing on the on pre-Pauline tradition through Scott and Poitras, though Scott and Poitras contend plausibly that the material here comes from Paul himself. In any case, what, it, what is decisive for interpreting these verses in the present context and, f and form of the verses, Don 1973, Dutot, Dutot 1992. It is speculative to base one's interpretation on, alleg on alleged Pauline additions to or subtractions from traditional material for there isn't sufficient evidence to verify such hypotheses. To interpret the text in light of its existing context it is methodologically wiser than appealing to an earlier form of the tradition to which we have no access. The bipartite structure of verses 3 and 4 is evident from the outline of the structure provided above. In verse 3, the focus is on the Davidic origin of the sun, which accords with the Jewish expectation that a ruler would come from the David's line. 2 Samuel 7, verses 12 through 16, Isaiah 11, Isaiah 11, verses 1 through 5 and 10, Jeremiah 23, verses 5 through 6. Jeremiah 33 verses 14 through 17, Ezekiel 34 verses 23 and 24, Ezekiel 37 verses 24 and 25, Psalms of Solomon 1721 up to 189, and some other references, continuing up to Genesis 49:10. The New Testament writings often ascribe Davidic sonship to Jesus. For example, Matthew 1:1, 1, 1, Matthew 20:30 and 31, Matthew 21:9. And 15, Luke 1:27, Luke Luke 1:32, and 69, Luke 2 verse 4, Luke 3 verses uh, 23 through 31, Acts 2:30, Acts 13:22 and 23, and Acts 13 verses 32 through 34, Second Timothy 2:8, Revelation verses uh, chapter 5 verse 5 and chapter 22 verse 16. The connection between Romans 1, 2 and Verse 3 should not be missed here. Jesus, as the son of David, fulfilled the promise made in the Old Testament regarding a future ruler from David's line. There is no suggestion here of embarrassment over Jesus' Davidic origin, contra Dunn, 1988a. 13. Rightly fits Meyer, 1993c, uh, page 234. And Fee, that's Gordon Fee, probably, 1994. Instead, his Davidic sonship is necessary qualification for the Messiah. Scholars often remark that Paul downplayed Jesus' Davidic origins, but such a conclusion is overstated. Paul probably emphasized that Jesus was David's son in his evangelistic preaching, in which he attempted to convince hearers that his gospel fulfilled the Old Testament promises. The Lucan account of Paul's preaching confirms this. Acts 13 verses 22 and 23 and verses 30, 32 through 34 compared with 2 Timothy 2.8. To rehearse this theme again in writing letters to churches, he established would be he, esta he established would be super superfluous. Significantly, Paul affirms that uh, Paul affirms the Davidic sonship of Jesus in the introduction of the letter to the Romans, since Paul had not planted the Roman church. Whatever whatever one thinks of the reliability of Acts, Romans itself testifies that Paul did not brush aside his roots. 
the Messiah came from the Jews, Romans 9, 5. The gospel is for the Jew first, Romans 1, 16 and Romans 2, verse 9 and 10. The promises made to the Jewish people will be fulfilled, chapters 9 through, through, through 11. And Gentiles should remember the Jewish roots of the olive tree, Romans 11, verses 15 through 18. Most important, 15, 12 implies that Jesus was from the line of David. Thus, we should reject any notion that Jesus' Davidic sonship was trivial or embarrassing to Paul. By stressing Jesus' Davidic origins, Paul shows that his gospel is, is, is in continuity with the Palestinian church and reminds Gentiles of their debt to the Jews. What is predicated of the Son in verse 4, despite the endorsement of his Davidic origins, is clearly a step up from what is said in verse 3. The nature of the contrast between verses 3 and 4 is the manner of some debate that I will sketch in briefly. First, some understand the contrast to be between the human and divine natures of Christ. Jesus was a son of God insofar as his human nature was concerned. Verse 3. But he is the eternal son of God with reference to his divine nature. Verse 4. In this interpretation, Katasarka refers to the human nature of Jesus Christ, while Katapneuma Hagiosunas refers to his divine nature. The participle Oris Fentos in verse 4 is interpreted to mean declare or show. Compared with Luther, 1972, page 148, the resurrection of Jesus did not make him the Son of God. You remember um, Fitzmaier said the same thing. It declared and revealed in a powerful way that he was and had always been God's Son. As a descendant of David, Jesus was a human being, but his resurrection from the dead declared to all that he was also the eternal Son of God. This is going to be the Christology of the New Testament by Oscar Coleman. This is page 306. The designation of Jesus as God. Our investigation, Theos, our investigation on the cr Christological utilization of Kurios, Logos, and Son of God has already shown that on the basis of the, Christ, of the Christological views connected with these titles, the New Testament could designate Jesus as God. This is true for each title in a particular sense. The Kurios is the present divine ruler who, since his exaltation, rules the Church, the world and the life of each individual. The Logos is the eternal revealer who communicates himself since the very beginning. The Son of God is the one who wills and works in complete oneness with the Father, from whom he goes forth and to whom he returns. In fact, even the concept Son of Man ultimately led us to Jesus' deity, since it shows Jesus as the only true image of God. The fundamental answer to the question whether the New Testament teaches Christ's deity is therefore yes. But to this yes, we must further add, on condition that we do not connect the concept with later Greek speculations about substance and natures, but understand it strictly from the standpoint of Heilsgeschichte. Without a divine Heilsgeschichte, it would not make sense to speak of Jesus' deity. He would then simply be one of the heroes of history, nothing more. Conversely, it would likewise be senseless without Heilsgeschichte to distinguish God's, God the Father from the Logos, his revelation, his, his son. The fact that Heilsgeschichte is strictly definitive for Christology also determines the specific subordination in the New Testament of Jesus Christ to God, not in the sense of later so-called subordinationism, but in the, in the sense that Jesus Christ is God only in his revelation of himself. This is the only dimension which the Old and New Testament t Testaments consider, but it does, does not exhaust the nature of God the Father. The later confusion of the Father and the Son, which the Church rightfully, rightly condemned in its various heretical guises, is foreign. Okay, uh, footnote, footnote one. Guises, such, such, such a confusion is nevertheless often character, characteristic of practical popular Catholic piety, despite its official co condemnation. Monophysitism. Monophy, uh, 
still dominates the religious thinking of the average Catholic. Jesus and God are often no longer distinguished even by even by, by terminology. The question has rightly been raised whether the need for veneration of Mary has not perhaps developed so strongly among the Catholic people just because this confusion has made Jesus himself remote from the believer. Is foreign the later confusion of father and, and son, which the church rightly condemned in its various heretical guises, is foreign to early Christianity precisely because its thinking is determined by Heilsgeschichte. The danger of such confusion arises only when one tries to solve the Christological problem with speculations about substance and natures. Since, since it is clear that the New Testament arrives at the conception of Jesus' deity in the sense indicated from the stand, standpoint of a group of basic Christological ideas, the question whether, uh, whether it also actually designates him God is only of secondary importance. We shall therefore examine the texts relevant to this question with the explicit presupposition that Jesus' deity by no means stands or falls with them. In the investigation, if the investigation should show, if the investigation should show that the New Testament did not call Jesus God, that would have no effect on our previous conclusions. But if, as I believe the exposition of these passages demonstrates that Jesus was occasionally designated God, this can only again confirm our earlier statements. It is regrettable that also in this purely exegetical question, this decision usually depends upon the theological standpoint of the scholar, and here again it is not only the conservative but also just as much as the opposite attitude which often influences exegesis. Actually, the passages which confer upon Jesus the title Kurios, the name of God, are at least as important as those in which he is directly addressed as God, and in some cases the former are even more important. We have seen that on the basis of the designation Kurios, early Christianity does not hesitate to transfer to Jesus everything the Old Testament says about God. It is surprising that scholars do not give more consideration to such an important fact. We have also seen in the preceding chapters that without being contradicted, Jesus' Jesus' opponents understood Son of God to mean identification with God. Passages which apply the designation God to Jesus are not numerous and some of them are uncertain from the viewpoint of textual criticism. Even in, in ancient time, in a, ancient times, some people apparently attributed undue, undue importance to the question whether or not Jesus was to be called God, especially in connection with the Christological controversies, the designation Theos is certain passages in certain passages was sometimes considered dangerous sometimes necessary. This explains the many textual variants precisely in the passages to which we now turn. By the very nature, the synoptic gospels drop out of, consid of consideration here. Just as Jesus did not call himself Kurios, neither did he call himself Theos. And the evangelists also seem unwilling to do so. The Gospel of John and Hebrews provide the clearest and least ambiguous evidence of the attrib attribution of Theos to Jesus. In the Gospel of John, there are at least two indisputable passages, John 1, 1, Kai Theos, and Hologos, and the Word was God, and John 20, 28, Thomas' confession, Hokurios, Mo Kai, Ho the Theos, Mo, my Lord and my God. We have already spoken of both these passages. They frame the whole Gospel. The incident involving Thomas closes the Gospel of John proper, since chapter 21 is a supplement. And at the same time, at the same time, marks his final and climactic confession. The last words of the risen Christ, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe, refer also to all future readers of the gospel. They should all believe without having seen. The evangelist's witness to the life of Jesus is intended to lead them precisely to this confession of Jesus, my Lord and my God. If therefore the whole Gospel culminates in this confession, and on the other hand, the author writes in the first verse of the first chapter, and the Logos was God, then there can be no doubt that for him all the other titles for Jesus, which are prominent in, in, in his work, Son of Man, Son of God, Lord, and in the prologue, Logos, ultimately point towards this final expression of his Christ Christological faith. We have said that the statement of John 1.1 may not be weakened to mean the Logos was divine. 
Besides, this explanation would be impossible in the confession of Thomas. On the other hand, we have seen that the Gospel of John says not only that the Logos is God, but also that he is with God. With R. Boltman, we concluded that the Logos, Jesus Christ, can therefore not be a second God beside God, nor an emanation of God, but God only in his self-revelation. This is the only sense which expresses the intention of the statement in John 14, 28, that the Father to whom Jesus returns after he completes his life, his life's work is greater than he. We must begin with these two certain passages in order to judge the third, John 1, 18, in which not all the manuscripts read monogenes theos, the later Greek fathers, the Latin fathers, and also the Curitonian Syriac read ho Monogene, monogenes huios. The reading theos is unquestionably better attested as every critical edition of the text makes immediately clear. If in spite of this, some ex exegetes, R. Botman among them, prefer huios, it is primarily because of the difficulty caused by theos in this context. Theos requires the following translation. No one has ever seen God, the only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father. He has made him known. But precisely because of this difficulty, this reading is the Lectio Difficilior, which was later supposed to have been made more understandable by the subs substitution of, of Huyos for Theos. On the other hand, it is not evident how a later copyist, in order to confer on Jesus the divine name could have undertaken to change huios to theos without elim eliminating the words who is in the bosom of the Father. If we take theos as original, its connection with the context does, pro does prove difficult for later Christians to understand, but it is by no means impossible in the framework of the other statements in the prologue. In the final analysis, the difficulty lies basically in the same Christological paradox which is present in John 1.1 1, 1, and is characteristic precisely of this Gospel. We read in the prologue, the Logos was with God and the Logos was God. This means nothing other than, the God, than, that, God was with, than that God was with God. If this is true, it corresponds fully with the Johannine idea that no one has ever seen God, the Father, but that God, as the monogenes, reveals him himself in the life of Jesus, the record of which is to follow. Therefore, following the best attested reading and with the majority of recent investigators, we add this third Johannine passage to the, to the other two. The, on, uh, the only begotten God, the only begotten of God. After what we have just said, this explanation seems to me unnecessary. The fact that the acceptance of the reading theos means that monogenes is used substan substantively should create no problems in view of the texts from the study of comparative religions cited by R. Boltman, Das Evangelium des Johannes, pages 47. Since the Johannine witness is quite clear, it is in order to agree with Windisch and Preisker that the saying in 1 John 5.20 refers to Christ, and we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding to know him who is true, and we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. This autos is the true God and eternal life. This explanation is convincing not only philologically, but also materially, for we find here the Christological circle which is grounded in fact and, with, and which determines Johannine thinking. Again, it is not surprising that outside the Johannine corpus only Hebrews unequivocally applies the title God to Jesus, since Hebrews actually belongs to the Johannine environment. It is true that the des designation occurs twice in consecutive verses, Hebrews 1.8, only in, in a quotation from Psalm 40.45.6, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever, verse 8, and therefore thy God, O God, has anointed thee, verse 9. But the psalm is quoted here precisely for the sake of this address, and the author remarks explicitly that it refers to the Son of God, Proston Huyon, verse 8. The address is thus very important to him. Here, here, as in the Gospel of John, Jesus can be addressed as God just because of the unique sonship which implies his deity. 
This agrees completely with the final conclusions in our preceding chapter. But at the same time, we also see here that the distinction between the Father and the Son is not simply effaced even when Jesus is designated God. According to the Christian interpretation of the statement in Hebrews 1.9, the word God as the subject refers to the Father as the object to the voc in the vocative to the Son. Thy God, the Father, has anointed thee, O God, the Son. Behind this statement lies a royal sound in which God addresses the king by the title God. In the Old Testament, too, the title Son of God for the king leads to him to him being addressed as God. See also Isaiah 9, 6. With this twofold use of the word God, Hebrews, like the Gospel of John, thus bears witness to the paradox of all Christology. We have seen this paradox expressed at the beginning of the prologue of John, which says of the Logos, Jesus Christ, that he is at the same time with God, and yet is himself God. I'll repeat this. We have seen this paradox expressed at the beginning of the prologue of John, which says of the Logos, Jesus Christ, that he is at the same time with God and yet is himself God. The continuation of these verses in Hebrews confirms what we said earlier about the relation between the title Kurios and Jesus' deity. Hebrews 1.10 quotes Psalm 102.25, which contains the address Lord, Kurie, instead of God. However, this title is used to prove exactly the same thing as the sound quoted in Hebrews 1.8. The Son of God is above the angels because he is addressed as God. There is no essential difference between Kurios and God as a form of address. This follows also from the con uh, content of the sound quoted. The Kurios, here identified as the Son of the Son Jesus Christ, is addressed as the creator of heaven and earth. Thou, Lord, didst found the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. Just as the prologue to the fourth gospel says, all things were made through him. So Hebrews also does not distinguish between the creator and the redeemer. We have emphasized from the beginning that this later distinction, which is encouraged by the threefold division of the church's creed and which, in, and which still persists today in most theologies, is not a New Testament one. This distinction between the Father and the Son does not mean the distinction between creation and redemption, but between God insofar as one can theoretically speak of Him, also apart from His revelation, and God insofar as the New Testament does speak of Him only as the one who reveals Himself. This is just what Hebrews means also. This direct designation of Jesus as God is less clearly attested in the writings of Paul then in the Gospel of John and in Hebrews. But we must again recall our introductory statement. The pre pre predilection of the Pauline letters for the title Kurios leaves no room to doubt that on the basis of this concept, and of course only in the sense that's determined, the Apostle could call Jesus God. Of the many relevant passages, 1 Corinthians 8, 6 could be mentioned. Or again the phrase, and en, en morpheteu upar, uparchon, Uparchon in the hymn to Christ in Philippians 2.6 also points in this direction for the designation image of God, Colossians 1.15, with which we connected it, implies Jesus' deity just as clearly as does the title Logos in John 1.1. 1, 1. Paul also says unambiguously in Colossians 2.9 that the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily in Jesus. However, this passage may be related to Gnostic speculations. It is clear that such a text like the preceding ones is just a step from directly designating Jesus God. Further, the fact that Paul prays to Christ, 2 Corinthians 12, 8, also proves that on occasion he really could call Jesus Theos. It is not certain, of course, whether he actually did. But even if this should be the case, it is certain that he does, not, does so, so only as an exception. This is not surprising just because for him Jesus is the courier. But even if this should be the case, it is certain that he does so only as an exception. This is not surprising just because for him Jesus is the Kurios, and because this name, which is above every name, clearly expresses Jesus' deity precisely from the aspect of his present lordship, which is especially important to Paul. From the unquestionably genuine letters of Paul, Romans 9.5 is the principal passage to be considered. It is the last part of a list of all the prerogatives of the chosen people of Israel. Ex, ex on, 
ex on ho Christos to catasarca, ho on epi panton theus, elogetos, el, elogetos eis, eistos hyonas, hamen, hamen. There are two possible translations depending upon how we punctuate this, the phrase. Either we place no punctuation marks after sarca, or at most a comma, or we place a full stop there. If there is no full stop, the following translation results of their race according to the flesh is Christ, who is over all God blessed forever. But if we place a period after sarca, the following sentence which contains Theos is grammatically independent of Christos. Then we have one of those dexologies which Paul sometimes interjects at high points in his expositions and which would be addressed to God the Father, not to Christ. After an enumeration of the gifts of grace bestowed upon Israel, chief of which is the birth of Christ according to the flesh, God the Father is then praised for all of them. God, who is over all, be praised forever. Amen. Without giving any sort of preference a priori to either of these possibilities on the basis of theological consideration, we must say that while the second cannot be excluded, it is hardly the one suggested by a philological and material consideration of the context. First, independent dexologies are differently constructed. They begin with the predicate nominative elogetos, compare it with 2 Corinthians 1.3, Ephesians 1.3. Whereas in Romans 9.5, the subject stands at the beginning, as is always the case wherever we find not a true independent dexology, but a dexological apposition, which follows an immediately preceding relative pronoun. God is praised in this way, for example, in Romans 1.25 and 2 Corinthians 11.31. Besides this, however, the structure of the preceding clause concerning Christ, katasarka, both formally and materially, requires a continuation which goes beyond katasarka. See the analogous formula in Romans 1.3. The words epipanton also make better sense in the context if they refer to Christ. They are then more than a mere rhetorical formula, and in this case the enumeration of the signs of Israel election t reaches a climax in the statement that from Israel comes one according to the flesh who is simply overall. We conclude that it is quite probable, if not certain, that Paul designates Jesus Christ as God in Romans 9.5. From the standpoint of textual criticism, the statement in Colossians 2.2 is uncertain. Knowledge of the mystery to theo Christo, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Nevertheless, a majority of investigators consider this reading to be original, especially since the following relative clause, verse 3, which certainly refers to Christo, ascribes to Christ whatever otherwise is said to be true of God. On the other hand, the formula in 2 Thessalonians 1.12, kataten, kataten harin to theu, hemon kai kurio yesu Christu, can hardly be considered as implying a single article and thus as referring only to Christ, although this possibility can be excluded. This analogous formula in 2 Corinthians 1 to grace and peace, apotheu patros, humon, kai kurio, yesu Christu, seems to prove that Paul speaks first of God, then of Christ. Titus 2.13 is also an uncertain passage, but it is probable that Christ is called God here, awaiting our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory, to megalo theu, Kai Soteros Humon Christu Yesu, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all iniquity and to purify for himself a people of, of his own. The phrase Theos Kai Soter is often used as a formula referring to God, and it is prob probably not to be torn apart. This suggests that God is not to be distinguished from God is not to be distinguished from Savior Jesus Christ here. In addition, the following clause, which, like that in Colossians 2.2, 2, certainly refers to Christ, also points to a function which is otherwise attributed only to God. Finally, a simultaneous appearing of God and Christ does not correspond to the usual ec expectation. We should make a similar decision in the case of 2 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, which also contains the phrase Theos, Kai, 
soter en dikai osuna tau theu human kai soteros Jesu Christu. The expression kurios kai soter, which is used as a designation for Jesus in the same book, 2 Peter 1 11 to 20, 3 2 and 18, indicates that theos belongs with soter as an attribute of Jesus Christ. We see here too that the Christological designation theos is variant is a variant of the more common kurios. When the author of Revelation says in 1912 of the horseman co called Logos, faithful and true, that he has another name which no one knows but himself, this may allude to the divine name. We may exclude Acts 20:28, 20, where the reading to is too is too uncertain. We come to the conclusion that in the few New Testament passages in which Jesus receives the title God, this occurs on the one hand in connection with his exaltation to lordship, Paul's letters and Second Peter, and on the other hand, and on the other hand in connection with the idea that he is himself the, div the divine revelation, Jehonine writings and Hebrews. Thus, this designation does not basically go beyond what we have already recognized in preceding chapters and the essential meaning of Jesus' other titles of honor. By way of contrast, Ignatius of Antioch, in, in whose writings the title Theos for Jesus occurs much more often, Smyrna 1 1, Ephesians 1 1, 7 2, 15 3, and 19 3, use, uses it in such a way that he tends to move away from the New Testament use in, in the direction of the later Christological con controversies. Of course, he also makes the dis distinction between the Father and the Son. Compare it with Smyrna, a letter, letter to Smyrna 8.1, 8, Mag, Mag 13.2. 13,